دكتور شريف الإخوة والزملاء يشرفني ويسعدني جدا إن أنا أكون هنا موجود النهاردة الحاجات اللي شفتها بيوند إيماجينيشن طبعا أنا كنت موجود هنا من الأول إنما أحييكم وأهنئكم على ما وصلتم لي في المرحلة دي لغاية دلوقتي والحاجة المهمة جدا إن أنتوا شباب مصر وكل مستقبل مصر في إيديكم أنتوا فدي حاجة مشرفة إنما في الوقت نفسه مسؤولية ضخمة عليكم أنتم لأن كل مستقبل مصر زي ما سمعتم من الدكتور زوير مصر الحبيبة لكل الناس عايزة تخدمها بيعتمد على الشباب على العلم على الابتكار وكل دي هي المبادئ اللي موجودة هنا في المدينة اسمحوا لي ان انا اتكلم بالانجليزي وطبعا زي ما انتوا عارفين لغة العلم دلوقتي هي بالانجليزي علشان نقدر نتفاهم مع العالم So my talk today is entitled The Glory and Threats of Science and Medicine. These are two things I happen to spend most of my life in with it. And I like to share a few ideas with you about science and medicine and how there is a lot of glory, but at the same time, there is threats, there are challenges. Now, the problem we are facing in science, technology, and medicine is huge. And I tend to Greek mythology, who knows about Greek mythology? Raise your hand. Greek mythology? Uh, and there are, there's a very deep thinking in the form of mythology, a myth. And that is exemplified or articulated by Prometheus. It's a mythical figure, Prometheus. He looked down to the earth and saw men crouched in caves, half naked, cold, and shivering. Prometheus was not pleased about that. So he asked Uranus, who was supposed to be his father and the Almighty, why has he kept the human race in ignorance? And darkness. You can imagine in the caves it's very cold, shivering, and they are in darkness. And that exemplifies the health problems, people are not well, and the darkness is ignorance. Now Uranus answered, Oh, what you call ignorance is innocence, my friend. As long as no, no one convinces them they are not happy, they are happy. Now we are facing almost exactly the same problem which Prometheus actually encountered. Darkness, ignorance, coupled with suffering. That's what science and medicine can do something about. Uh, just to complete the picture or the story of Prometheus, what did Prometheus do? Do you all know or not? It's a myth. It didn't happen, obviously, but it's something which tells us what can happen or how the thinking goes on. So Prometheus was not convinced at all 
What did he do? He went to the sun because he can fly and go to the sun and do everything. Took a little branch and lit the branch, brought it down to earth, to the caves, to bring what? To bring warmth against suffering and to bring light against ignorance. So there was wonderful, something started. That's what you're facing. You need to fight ignorance and you need to fight suffering. The two big enemies. This is not the end of the story because he has acted against the almighty Uranus. So what did Uranus do? He said, okay, you are cursed. And what's the curse? There will be a vulture, a big vulture, will come and feed on your liver every night, eat his liver. But Uranus or Prometheus uh, had a savior in that the vulture would eat his liver, but in the morning he would grow another liver. And he goes about doing things. How did he do that? I submit that this was through stem cell biology. <laughs> so that's a little story to show you what science and medicine can do. Let's move on. My own branch, heart surgery, cardiac surgery, needs to be defined and redefined. Hmm. You say, but it's so obvious. If you go to the dictionary, uh, cardiac is heart, surgery is cutting. So it's cutting the heart or operating the heart. This cannot be more wrong. This is totally false. Actually, cardiac surgery is the science and art, more about the interaction between science and art. But those two things are inseparable. They are one thing. Of applying a specialty to whom? To the community. Where is the community? It's around us. But also it's global. We have responsibility to the people around us, but also to the rest of the world. We're not living in isolation. We're living in one world. So that's a much better definition which makes you happy or makes us happy and can be moving. The promise is obvious. You can heal, you can teach, you can discover, you can interact with other human beings. All are fantastic opportunities which we can take. So there's nothing more pleasing than seeing a child who's dying and then you treat, you see him or her 15 years later or sometimes longer, coming looking very happy. Wow, this is fantastic. So this healing is wonderful. I keep being reminded of that, like I see a patient who 34 years ago, that shows my age, uh, came to the hospital dying, and so he had an emergency heart transplant. Three, four, 34 years later, he is entertaining his grandchildren, and he enters the Guinness Book of um, what is unusual. Teaching is very important, and it's exemplified here, because teaching, passing this knowledge to the next generation is so important. Discovery is accelerating. And human interaction, meeting other people around the world in a congenial fashion is wonderful. There are threats as well. Because if you have a powerful tool, you can do harm. You can have false discoveries. And this is really can be very harmful. 
we have beware of false discovery. Uh, over recognition, people say, keep saying to you, wow, you are wonderful. If you believe that you are wonderful, uh, you have, that's a massive harm. You have lost a lot. You really have to realize that you are just an other human being trying to do things which other people would love to do. And you're lucky to be doing that. So over-recognition is really bad, whether it is material or otherwise. Then there is destructive competition. You think, oh, he's getting better than me. Oh, what does it matter? You look at you, yourself, you can better yourself. And in any case, the so-called uh, person who is trying to compete with you, he's trying to do the same thing. He, you remember the enemies of ignorance and suffering? So the more people you have are fighting the same battle, the better. So why are you thinking about, oh, he's getting better than so This is a great threat. Commercialism as well, because um, you have to, commercialism has two aspects to it. One is necessary, is that is if you discover something and you want it to reach the community, your beloved community I talked about around you and the world, you have to make it commercial. But at the same time, you have to have the pure side of science and medicine, which is humanitarian and pure humanitarian. So how can you reconcile those two things? It's important to think about it. And losing contact with the patient, which is humanity, is very dangerous. One of my very uh, revered friends, almost like Dr. Zoel, you have heard that we're very close, um, is Aldo Castaneda. Who is Aldo Castaneda? Aldo is, uh, maybe some of you might know the name, but I don't expect you to. Aldo Castaneda comes from Guatemala. And he was the professor of pediatric, of cardiology, heart surgery, at Harvard University. So he was really a wonderful person and he has many wise sayings he devised many operations it's a wonderful man but when he was the president of the american association of thoracic surgeon he gave a presidential address and many people talk about themselves in the presidential address. I find that really distasteful. Not Aldo. Aldo, when he spoke to the American Association with 3,000 people sitting there, he talked about the training of a heart surgeon. And he called it an Apollonian quest. Apollonian quest. What does that mean? He then went on to say Apollo, back to the Greek mythology. The Greeks are very close to us, by the way. Apollo was the god of intellect, the arts, and healing. It implies harmony, balance, rationality, loyalty, and discipline. All these qualities, says Aldo, are essential for a heart surgeon. So think of it. The arts, healing, see the two things together again, harmony, balance, rationality, thinking, loyalty, to whom? To the patient, discipline, all these things are required from you 
when you're approaching science and medicine. Now I've talked about arts and science, and that has been articulated uh, many times. So the humanities for a long time, uh, even in the United Kingdom, there was the Royal Society, which is the oldest academy of sciences, 350 years. And uh, there was, it dealt only with science, engineering and science. But the humanities were represented by the British Academy, which is a building next door. Why should that be? They are one and the same. Science and the humanities are together. And several philosophers in the past have talked about that, saying the humanities, for example, Heinz Kuhn's, says the humanities open up to the uncertainty that is our common fate as travelers and sometimes help us to better accept the hazards of this journey, which we're studying in science, obviously. Humanities offers uh, us a vision that transcends our own faith and very importantly teaches understanding. So it's very important to have both science and humanity. But what is science? Well, science has been defined clearly as the search for the truth. And it has been said by many philosophers of science that the truth is beautiful. And Benedictus de Spinoza was a, actually a Dutch uh, philosopher say, it follows therefore that the truth manifests itself. Another important thing is that you must realize, and Karl Popper, another philosopher, has said that, is that the truth is unattainable. You can't reach the, tr the truth. So what do you do? You keep trying to get near the truth and call it current knowledge. Who knew all that but the ancient Egyptians? How did the ancient Egyptians talk about science? They showed that the goddess of the truth, and they have many pictures of her, Maat, was the most beautiful goddess. So the truth is beautiful. Science is beautiful. And the next thing that he knew about is that it is unattainable. So when you come near Mat, she grows huge wings and she flies away. So you have to keep trying to find the truth. And how do you do that? There are two things. One is through importantly, having theories, and you will learn about that here at the city, that you must have theory-driven uh, research. But what do I do with the theory? Popper says, I told you about Sir Karl Popper before, um, that instead of us trying to prove that our theory is correct, we should try and refute it. And he wrote a whole book. For those of you interested, you can read it. It's entitled Conjectures and Refutation. What does that mean? It means that you should try and refute your own theory. If you can't, then you are near the truth. If you can, then you're still nearer the truth because you have moved forward. He says it's rather unfortunate that many of us don't do that. But the, what, what is good is that our peers around the world 
apply the refutation. And in so doing, we should say thank you, thank you, peers, because you're driving us towards the truth, whether they can or cannot refute. It's all a friendly atmosphere. We should not be upset when we send a manuscript for review and the reviewers come back with all sorts of ideas refuting. We should say thank you, thank you, because you are helping us. And it's very important to be humble. We are not taught that in Egypt, unfortunately. We're too proud. We really have to be humble. If you want to be an intellectual, you really have to be humble. And that has been said by other people as well. Saying, for example, John Eccles says, I can rejoice, I can now rejoice, even in the falsification of a cherished theory, because even this is scientific success. The same idea, humbleness. What humbleness? Intellectual humbleness. Should not be too proud. I am right and everybody else here is wrong. It doesn't work. And again, other people have talked about intellectual humility. You can read that yourself. Now, if we look at the mix of science, and this is happening here in a big way, you have Biomedical, you have engineering, and you have humanities, and all that is really important. And I have learned that throughout my career. Although I was, in the beginning of my career, very um, devoting most of my time, if not all of it, to learning how to operate, how to devise new operations, how to make it safe for the patient. But then I realized that it's really important to use all the other available specialties, particularly basic science. This cartoon which you see is just a cartoon of a molecule, actually two molecules. One is circa 2 and the other is phospholumbar. Why are they important? Because they play a massive role in heart failure, in people developing heart failure. So therefore, uh, as a surgeon, I have to understand that if I really care about my patients and I want to make them better, I must know what is the basis of this and how can I prevent it. And this has been quite helpful in our department. These are other molecules. And eventually, we've been working together with a large group in the Department of Surgery. Uh, I was uh, trusted of um, establishing and starting the first British Heart Foundation professorial unit at Imperial College. Hmm, what do I do? Uh, so I went said, do I collect a whole lot of surgeons? No, I didn't. I actually collected a whole lot of scientists and engineers. And people said, what are you doing? This is the Department of Surgery. I said, yes. But I showed you that surgery is not just cutting. It's a whole lot of other things. We have to understand what we're doing. We have to understand how we can prevent it. Oh, but you say, you're putting yourself out of a job. Oh, wonderful. Put me out of a job. Then I would have achieved the most I can because I'm fighting disease. I'm not fighting for myself or for my department or for my group. We are fighting a disease and we are fighting ignorance. And how do we do that? Have all specialties together. And this is uh, what Dr. Henry was showing me this morning again. It's just like music, what you're doing here. 
because you're putting everything together and having a big army, all of you here, to fight those two big enemies, suffering and ignorance. And obviously, they are linked, science and medicine. So we went on to work with artificial heart and looked at the mechanics of what happens in the machine, but also what happens in the body. And that's by looking with echo. Very interesting, the interaction between body and biology. Fantastic. And learned a lot and used medicine and uh, what we call the Hairfield Protocol, Combination Therapy. And we studied how that interacts with heart function, but also with cells, how they grow uh, in response to a specific drug which we use, and how do they look like, and how do they have these variations which enable them to contract. Very exciting. Net result, patient enjoying life. This man had an artificial heart, he was dying, and then he recovered. And recovery doesn't mean just live, but live very well. Go to the beach with your wife, have a great time. Life is here to be enjoyed, and that's what you want to do. That's the same chap sitting in his garden after being cured by the combination of many types of science, engineering, medicine. And this young lady also, uh, she's a nurse and she was dying one night, but she, had, she was treated by the same type of treatment. And she writes and saying, thank you. You have brought me back to life and I'm now doing exactly what I wanted to do, to be a nurse. And that's a picture of me in the world as a nurse. Thank you for allowing me to do this. So you see the link between science, chemistry, engineering, medicine, and bring it back to humanity. So, now I bring you to near the last part of my uh, talk and the, um, I would like to present to you one of my heroes. All of us have heroes. If we do not, we should. Who are our heroes? Our heroes are our role models. Something you will aspire to be like or to emulate. And at the Royal Society, at the Academy of Sciences in, the, in London, uh, they entrusted me to uh, edit a book entitled Best Practice in Role Modeling. Why that? Because it became apparent that young people like yourselves were not going into science, especially physics in the UK. And we wanted to know how we can lure them to science and physics and medicine. So there was a research project. And the research project showed that Approximately 85% of successful scientists went into science because of a role model. How did this happen? Who was the role model? A teacher, a scientist, a philosopher, um, a member of the family. So that put a lot of responsibility on the role model to help the, uh, uh, to recruit people into science. For me, I had more than one role model. I was very lucky. My dad, one of the teachers, and then people like P. 
Peter Medor. Now, who is Peter Medor? Now, Peter Medor is somebody I met and had a profound effect on my career. Peter Medor, the late Sir Peter Medor, has a Lebanese father, an English mother, born in Rio de Janeiro, educated in Oxford, and he wrote many books. One of them is entitled his autobiography, Memoirs of a Thinking Cabbage. He says cabbage because uh, if you are born to a Lebanese father, English mother in Rio de Janeiro, uh, go back to the UK. You can't be more mixed up than that. And yet, Peter Medawar, like Dr. Tsui, won the Nobel Prize. What did he win the Nobel Prize for? It was transplantation biology. He was the first to show that the immune system is not invincible. And therefore, he started the art and science of organ transplantation, whether it was a kidney, a, kidney, a heart, or whatever else. But that's not the end of the story, um, because Peter Medawar was also a philosopher. He actually taught philosophy at the University of Oxford. And he was also a big humanitarian. And I put here as number three of uh, uh, the, the celebrations of the paper which Peter Medawar uh, wrote in Nature in 1953, entitled uh, Induction of Specific Immune Tolerance by Billingham, Brent, and Medawar. This was the beginning of transplantation. But why is he not the first author in the paper? That also has a story. The story is that Billingham, who is currently or until very recently was a professor in the US, he was actually an Englishman working in the lab of Sir Peter Meadow. And the story Billingham tells that he, one afternoon, the prof walks in and says, Rupert, it was Rupert Billingham, Rupert, um, you're giving a paper at the Oxford Research Society next Monday on specific immune tolerance. So Rupert said, excuse me, prof, what are you talking about? He said, the work you're doing in the lab, Rupert, he says, Prof, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I have nothing to prepare. He says, Rupert, please, I've already given your name. And so he says, OK, Prof, I'm going to France on holiday on that day. I'm sorry. You, I give you everything, and you give the paper. He actually was not going to France or anything. He was trying to escape, like many of us try sometimes, successfully or unsuccessfully. <laughs> so um, the prof, Peter Medawa, went on to give the lecture to the Oxford Research Society. And everybody went mad. Wow, this is the greatest discovery in science for many years. Who was at the back of the lecture theater? Billingham. So he said, I couldn't believe it, that he was showing my data. I never understood it myself. This is unbelievable. So he escaped again, came on Monday, and said, um, I hear the, the lecture was fantastic, bro. He said, yeah, yeah. Now you write it for nature. He said, but I never understood it. You write it, Prof, and put my name somewhere. He said, no, it's your experiment, young man. You write it, and you're the first author. 
And this paper won the Nobel Prize. But you see again the vision, the ability to, uh, to interpret data, and the humility to give credit to your students. All that Peter Medawar did very successfully. So I've tell, I told you a bit about who is Medawar and uh, how he talked about specific immune tolerance. That is Peter Medawar in his younger days. And uh, this penetrating Middle Eastern, you might say, eyes, dark eyes, looking into the future. And this is a, an interesting picture. It was published in Nature because the same Peter Meadow staring at the microphone, the BBC, trying to recruit scientists. And apparently, uh, why Nature put Isn't He Beautiful is that some of the audience a young lady shouted at the top of his vo her voice, isn't he beautiful? So nature uh, put it on the picture. Uh, obviously, she meant the truth and science, not the man. Now, if you look at uh, Peter Meadow in his latter days, again, the very deep thinking, reflective person, which I actually met. You can imagine. Um, he has been called many things scientist, a tireless searcher for the truth, merciless debunker of myth. If he sees myth, something wrong, he will tell you immediately. I told you, father of organ transplantation, a philosopher, a humanist who loved people and tried very hard, he said, that he worked on tolerance because there were uh, many soldiers coming in the Second World War with severe burns who were going to die. And Peter Madoa wanted to do something to stop them dying. He was a great humanist. He's written many books, The Future of Man, Pluto's Republic, and I haven't got time to tell you about Pluto's Republic, a funny story. The Art of the Soluble, Induction of a Young Scientist, The Limits of Science, The Threat and Glory uh, of Science. I borrowed some of his words, The Threat and Glory. Have you noticed? That's from my hero. And... Um, Memoirs of a Thinking Tradition, I already talked to you about it. One of the best things he has written is he defined creativity. That you want, if you want to be creative, and this university here, the city, tries to teach you how to be creative. I hope. Dr. Sidi told me that that's what he teaches to you. You're taught here to be creative and original. But what's creativity? You can go back to Peter Medawa, and he says, creativity is producing ostensibly out of nothing, you start with nothing, something of beauty, order, significance. He starts with beauty, where beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So beauty something, if you discover something fantastic, it looks beautiful. It is said, for example, that Rosalind Franklin, who knows Rosalind Franklin? Who was she? The red DNA double helix. Uh, there is a, thank you for reminding us, because she is uh, adored uh, at the Royal Society as an icon, a female icon of science. Because it's said that in a, um, in a documentary about the discovery of DNA, that when Rosalind, uh, I don't know whether you've seen it on BBC or not, that's a beautiful thing, 
and when she knew that um, they produced a model of the double helix, uh, she took the train from London to Cambridge and she went into the basement where that model was built from bits of, uh, of wood. And uh, when she walked into the room, she looked at it and she burst into tears. And she kept sobbing. And uh, then uh, the discoverer, one of them, the American one, uh, is shown in the film. Uh, going to sing, Rosalind, Rosalind, why are you crying? We will put your name on the paper in nature. And she looked and said, I'm not crying. I don't want my name on the paper. But said, well, why are you crying then? And she said, I'm, I'm crying because it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> she thought that the mother was so beautiful and she was gripped with joy that she couldn't stop crying. So I think that's uh, what uh, Sir Peter means when he says creativity, you can produce something beautiful. Just what Rosalind saw in the double helix model. Order, you know that something of order is nature, is, shows you what order is all about. And the third word he chooses, significance. Significance to whom? To mankind. So this is just in a very short statement. Uh, Peter Meadow tells us what creativity and what discovery is all about. And I hope you have a great time doing just that. You have a long life ahead of you. And you have excellent education here. At least it started. And you have challenges. And um, you have opportunities for doing things like Peter Medor has done. There are many ways of achieving what you want to do. And here I just show some what Peter Medor has talked about and the modern ways of trying to do that uh, and how near are we I will not go through the science of it but I'll just end by the title of my talk and what Peter Meadow said Peter Meadow said it is the great glory as it is the great threat of science that everything which is in principle possible can be done if the intention to do so is sufficiently resolute. How passionate about you are about your science. How are you going to pursue it with all the qualities Aldo Casaneda talked about? Art, humanity, discipline, passion, hard work, all these things. So where do we go from here? I think induction, for example, I'm putting this as, a, as an example of Medawar's tolerance, is badly needed to rejuvenate tissue and organ transplantation. There are millions of people dying. We have to do it. It has not been finished as yet. The question I put to you is how resolute is our clinical, our doctors, and scientific community. I hope you all the best in your endeavors, and I hope that all of you are resolute in what you want to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Magdi. 
I'd like to ask you about the, you said that when you find the truth, you'll be happy. So what, what is your comment on uh, Andrew Guide's uh, philosopher actually? He's when he said, doubt those who found the truth and believe those who, uh, who didn't find it. Say that again, who said that? Uh, Andrew Guide, he's a philosopher. Yes. Yeah, uh, I define the truth in a slightly different manner, like I showed with um, Karl Popper, that the truth, the absolute truth, we cannot reach. And that's why we're writing paper after paper on the same subject. But uh, if we, it's not that we dichotomize people into the truth and, the, and, those, and the falsification. There's a big gray area in the middle, and that's where we are running. And uh, some of my friends said, uh, thank God for gray. What does that mean? Because gray is something you can keep moving towards the truth and current knowledge. That's what we're doing in research. It's not absolute that he has the truth or she has the truth and he hasn't got it. It doesn't work. Uh, thanks, Doc. Uh, could, you give, uh, could you give us a little bit of information about your latest discovery? Your latest discovery about uh, making a valve using nanotechnology device. Your latest La discovery. Latest discovery yes. in? Uh, in making a valve using nanotechnology device. Oh, thank you for that. Um, this is um, research which has been done in our lab and in other labs around the world uh, to tissue engineer a living heart valve. And this stems from the fact that we have done a lot of research on the biology of heart valves. And it turns out that heart valves are not just two flaps moving by mechanical factors. They are actually very, very sophisticated. And they preempt hemodynamic events. And we have a proof as well in that if you take the living valve from the same patient on the right side and put it on the left, it performs so much better. It prolongs the patient's life and it gives him or her better quality of life. So we've been dedicated to make a valve which is living to emulate what is in the body. And uh, you're referring to our recent paper uh, commented on in Nature, whereby we have used uh, a scaffold, an intelligent scaffold, which not only allows the appropriate type of stem cells to differentiate to what we want, but also instruct them to do what we want it to do. It's only the beginning, though, or near the beginning of like, a, it's not the end, it's not even the end of the beginning, but it is a step in the right direction because we are totally dedicated to produce that tissue engineered living heart valve, and also that same matrix we have described. And I know many people are interested in uh, similar things. Uh, uh, can be used for reducing heart muscle, because again, it lines them up, it allows them to live, and it instructs them to do the right thing. Have I answered your question? Uh, I'd like to know about um, uh, the man and the woman now with the artificial heart. Uh, what differences uh, from the uh, uh, natural human? Did they continue to have feelings? And uh, didn't there uh, uh, wasn't there any uh, research uh, on them on this area? Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, talking about cardiac transplantation, not artificial heart, cardiac transplantation from a man to a woman, or from a woman to a man. Uh, there has been a lot of stories about that. I mean, I can tell you one story uh, with an American lady 
uh, has written saying that uh, she had cystic fibrosis, she had heart lung transplantation, and um, which was very successful. And then she suddenly found uh, that her habits has changed that she liked classical music now, before, she now likes rock and, uh, and she likes sedate cars, now she likes motorcycles. What happened? So the story goes that uh, she found out that the donor was uh, one of those young devils going on motorbikes and, and so she acquired exactly the same tastes. I think that's uh, a not scientifically backed story because the heart um, is a pump in the first place all right so we can actually replace the heart by a mechanical pump and the patient can live but 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 this is again an oversimplification because the heart we are learning all the time we continue to do the same has many nerve cells and it communicates with the brain all the time. And it's also an endocrine organ. It secretes uh, materials, hormones to regulate the body. What it doesn't do though uh, is to think or allow you to like classical music or something else. I think that's an exaggeration. Uh, I was once interviewed uh, on BBC on the same topic uh, but I made a mistake and said however anything is possible so they quoted me the first morning that I supported the idea that the heart uh, influences personality it responds to emotions it can regulate things but it does not emanate thinking the thinking is all up, up here. It interacts all the time. Have I answered your question? Yes? No? You're not happy? <laughs> um, Dr. Yaoub, I read your recent article and actually I tried to understand as best as I can. I have a question. Uh, what is the anisotropic extracellular matrix? I, I didn't get the idea. And if I wanted, to, if I if I want to um, know more about this, where can I find uh, online uh, about the stem cell biology and nanotechnology devices? Thank you very much indeed. You obviously have read the article. Um, anisotropy is a quality in tissues of the heart valves and the root of the aorta around the valve. And it means, for example, it is that it's like magic in that if you have um, the leaflet or the cusp of a valve, it extends in one direction by 40% and in the other, and that is in the radial direction. But in the circumferential direction by 4%. That is an isotropy. If you have a piece of tissue, it uh, actually, it's, it behaves the same in both directions. But in this case, in one direction, it has different mechanical properties to the other direction. That is anisotropy. Okay? What was the second part of your question? Uh, stem cell biology. Stem cell biology, you have the undifferentiated cells which are capable of dividing but also differentiating in different directions. Uh, the challenge is that which direction you want it to go and uh, to say mesenchymal or endodermal or uh, ectodermal, neurogenic, cardiogenic, every cell in the body is different. 
not only that, but we are learning that the covering of the heart valve tissue on one side is different from the covering on the other side. And not only that, that's not when it is on the valve itself in situ, but even if you take it out and culture it, it still behaves differently. You put uh, a fluid across it and stress, and it, it works, it responds differently to the other side. So the challenge is how to get the stem cell, the undifferentiated cell, to differentiate to precisely the type of cell you want it to do. There are many molecules involved, and I think somebody like yourself can discover many things like that. Hello, my question for you is, uh, so as a heart surgeon, what goal or uh, final achievement are you working towards or aiming for? Uh, thank you very much. As a heart surgeon, what aim? I happen to have more than one aim. Would you allow me? Or one aim? Uh, uh, first is uh, to conquer certain diseases which are killing a lot of people, like heart attacks and like heart failure. Those are two big things. And then there is valve disease, rheumatic heart disease. But the big thing. And the other thing is to make heart surgery and medicine uh, presented to the global community. And by the global, I mean the whole world in an equitable fashion. It's no good having it the, the only, like what's happening now, to less than 20% of the population of the world. Is that right? Cannot be. And that'd be the same in this country, for example. Everybody in the country has to be, the, to have the right for heart surgery to be offered in an equitable fashion. So this is the so-called global cardiology. So that's what I want to see. Equity, as well as discovery against those big diseases, because cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer anywhere in the world. So that cannot go on. So that's what I want. Very simple.